Thank you for tuning in to Movie Geeks United. In this episode, we're thrilled to welcome cinematographer Faden Papa Michael back to our podcast. His mark on the film industry is impressive. He's lensed, he's lensed a string of diverse films from The Pursuit of Happiness to Sideways to Nebraska to Ford vs. Ferrari. His latest project is receiving widespread acclaim across the critical community, The Trial of the Chicago 7, the latest offering from writer and director Aaron Sorkin. Prior to the onslaught of the pandemic, Faden was visiting family in Greece, and he's remained there ever since. But he's managed to pass the time by sitting behind the director's chair on an upcoming thriller. Then I had all this time, all my projects and movies were getting canceled in the U.S., and then um, uh, I developed a project, and we financed it, and now I'm directing and shooting uh, a, a thriller set on the Greek island. Uh, mm. but, uh, I'm halfway through. i got two more weeks, and and uh, then, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see where I go from here. You've, uh, <laughs> y- you've directed uh, before. Uh, on a yeah, uh, on a couple of occasions. So how, how does it feel yeah, to get yeah. back Actually, into that? Five times, but it goes way back to like sketch artists with Drew Barrymore and mm. Sean Young, and then uh, I've done a movie in Greece before, like twelve years ago, with Nick Nolte. You know, mostly small festival runs, and I mean, the first one was a Showtime original, played on Showtime. And they even made a sequel. <laughs> I love your work, and I spoke to you uh, several years ago for I believe I believe uh, Nebraska. Uh, uh, yeah. But uh, but I'm a big big fan of your work, and I watched Trial of the Chicago Seven, and and I loved it. Uh, I'm wondering. Oh, that's good. I'm wondering when you were approached to do this. Uh, yeah. Did you have any knowledge of this period of events, or was a lot of research involved? Uh. I mean, I was aware of it, uh, actually, mostly through uh, Haskell Wexler's film, Medium Cool, yeah. which, uh, you know, we ended up using um, a bit of his footage in the film. Uh, the editor, Alan Baumgarten, like, combed through all the available footage from the demonstration and the park, and, uh, and you know, a lot of it was actually footage that Haskell had shot on 16 millimeter. Uh, in color and uh, we put it in the film as little black and white intercut with our footage when we recreated the the riot and um, it was great because we actually got to shoot in the actual location we shot in uh, Grand Park and we had the hill with a statue and you know uh, seeing having all this footage available to us you know helped us dial in like the amount of tear gas and of course we only had 200 extras and there were 10,000 <laughs> demonstrators <laughs> in the park. Uh, um, but, you know, because of Aaron's writing and then being so, uh, there are only these vignettes when you leave a courtroom and it's literally often like three seconds, five seconds where we cut to the, the park, you know, it, um, uh, you know, it helped, uh, not making a movie about the riots, but they're really just these vignettes that play. Yeah, uh, when you leave a courtroom, that uh, you know it helped us. I, I I send my two camera operators handheld in the crowd we had and put a bunch of tear gas and say I said to them, just make a documentary about this. So, you know, because we wanted the energy of the, those riot scenes to kind of contrast, you know, the courtroom, which is much more composed and static, and uh, you know, it's a lot of talking heads, of course. Yeah, uh, you know, you got a defendant and the judge and the jury and the persecutor. And, uh, you know, so I, I contrasted the shooting style of the park with that of a courtroom. Um, but, and it works, uh, it works beautifully. But when you, when you're, sh- when you're filming, um, uh, a scene like those riots, uh, yeah. you know, and you're dealing with a couple of hundred people, like you just said, uh, yeah. Are, are you are you communicating with your cameraman by headset? Go here, go yeah, there. Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Okay. I use uh, these, this HME system. It's it's a uh, uh, voice activated headsets, and I you know I'm mostly to t- make sure they're not shooting the same thing. <laughs> so mm. I mean, we we kind of roughly. I mean, it's not shot listed or storyboarded at that point. I mean, it's really just go 
shoot it. And um, but you know you do want to make sure they don't end up with you know accidentally covering the same shot or getting into each other's shots. So there's a bit of a you know almost like a, a TV director is like you know go get that girl that with a flag when you know and then you you get the the cop who's beating uh, this guy on the head. So uh, you know it's but. The, the very short pieces and, and Aaron's writing is so specific he really just doesn't care to cover too much except exactly what he needs for his writing because it's all about the rhythm of the language and you know mm-hmm. he knows exactly that he's only going to go to that shot for three or five seconds and you know so you don't really have to overproduce it um I mean, if it was a normal movie, a normal meaning like a big movie about the riots, we'd have, you know, many more extras. We'd have, you know, some wide sweeping shots showing the whole scale of things. But um, uh, in this case, you know, we knew he only like taking the bridges when they cross the bridges. I mean, that's a pretty big setup. We got all the daily dozers, you know, those Jeeps with the barbed wire and mm. the tanks and the cops and the... Um, the soldiers and but you know really all he wants is like i need an insert of the bottle hitting the ground and then i need a shot where dave is like trying to stop the crowd because right. he knows exactly how it's gonna um uh, intercut you know with when he leaves a witness in the stand and you know it's gonna just use literally just use like three seconds so it's 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 kind of would just be counterproductive to to shoot or cover more than just the moments that he needs for the story. So sure, that that was helpful, you know. That always that always fascinates me the the dynamic of putting those scenes together because a, a film set is obviously uh, as controlled an environment as you can manage, and yet what you're trying to capture is chaos. <laughs> right, it's like yeah. controlled chaos. But sometimes you know you don't want to design it, and it'll seem too stagey and mechanically worked out. So. You, you you'd look for all these happy accidents and you know in order to get those you have to be um just reactive and intuitive and instinctive and and you know you 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 create you set it up um i mean you set the situation then you kind of just go for it and yeah you know that's the, that's the way to do that right? and run to, as you've mentioned running counter to that is this uh this courtroom drama. I mean, much, much of the time, that that's that's where you're shooting is in this courtroom setting, and you're dealing with a number of of characters. What are the specific yeah. challenges of of that kind of set work? Well, it's always you know, as a visual storyteller, you're always concerned about having to do sixty percent of a movie in a courtroom setting because you know the blocking is not that. Uh, challenging. I mean, everyone's sitting in the same seats in every scene. You know, sure the counselor, you know, the the uh, attorney of defense is, you know, he takes the floor, so does the prosecutor. But you know, they basically just have a little arena to pace back and forth. And I mean, the blocking is pretty set. Um, plus, our other challenge was we build this courtroom in a. Uh, in a schoolhouse, um, but we treated it like a stage, but it was actually bigger than the original uh, courtroom. Also had these windows, which the original courtroom didn't have. Um, you know, the the trial goes over a six-month period, and so I wanted to show passage of time. Like, I, don't, I didn't want to have the same mood every time we're in there, you know, like playing mm-hmm. the obvious, like, beams through the windows and uh, people did smoke back then in court, so I did put atmosphere, which I normally don't do. But, you know, I wanted, so I signed, I made a whole breakdown of what scenes, you know, should play in, in sunny light, like the opening day, day one of the trial, because there's still some optimism in our defendants. And, you know, even one character goes, this is like the Academy Awards. <laughs> trials you know and i'm mm. just happy to be nominated so i played that <laughs> sunny and then same i played the last day the the verdict day also sunny because you know tom hayden stands up and starts reading all the names and they're wearing the white prison outfits at that point and i wanted him to sort of glow in this white uh angelic heroic sunbeam mm. um but you know there were other scenes for example when sasha baron Cohen. Navi Hoffman gives 
his um, uh, when he takes his, uh, the, the uh, seat, you know, and he goes like, "Sorry, man, just give me give me a second. I've never been on trial for my thoughts before." Uh, you know, I played that Moody or like Moody over at Cast Day. So I wanted to show that there's a lot of passage of time because the script is very nonlinear, as you know. And sometimes, you know, you have somebody in the stand, like a cop, uh, for literally one line. Then you go away for some uh, vignettes, whether the flashbacks. And then you come back, you're not even back to the same cop. You're to another cop who's actually also like the trial going back and forth is not even linear so the whole script is very fragmented that way and mm. it's very important you know to to have the shots play at the right length that's why Aaron really doesn't want a lot of extra coverage um, because he just very specifically he just basically wants to just see the person who's talking yeah now me as a cinematographer and coming from, you know, a lot of work with James Mangold, and, you know, we shoot a lot of reactions, a lot of... And just so... And, and you know, also talking to Alan Baumgarten, the editor, who had also cut Molly's game, he's like, please, you know, give me other shots, give me, you know, reaction shots, give me the jury, give me the judge, and, um, you know, and Aaron was like, really, we need that? I don't really need that. And, you know, <laughs> so I didn't want to force him into a lot of shots. I mean, I like people who have very specific... Uh-huh. A concept of what they need but uh you know i also know that you know telling it visually and uh it's not like an audio play so i mean we you know it's valuable to have uh, in the courtroom so i always try to rake people like when i do a close-up i'm never really frontal i'm trying to include you know i shoot the close-ups with slightly wider lensing and that still doesn't isolate them and show the people next to them and mm. you know, like little profiles, little slider moves, little rotations, just to keep them connected to where they are. Although they're basically always sitting in the same places. So that, that was the challenge for the courtroom. Yeah. And also I wanted it more composed and more classic. Um, so it, it contrasts to the energy when we do leave and, uh, you know, where we go to the conspiracy office, or we go to, uh, of course, the riots and on the streets and mm. taking the bridges and all that. So, um, but yeah, it's it's a challenge, um, uh, especially with Aaron, because you know he'll be the first one to admit it. Like you know, he relies very heavily uh, on the cinematographer and on the editor, and um, he sees uh, his script really like it's for him it exists on page and normally you know i would say well you know script a movie gets made in three stages in the writing process during the shooting and then during editing in his case i would say the movie gets made when he writes it and then it's all about getting it as close as possible to mm. that you know, yeah it's, he, it's, it's not there's not a lot of room for um you know, to discovering or improvising. I mean, if and you know, have a cast that you know, Sasha Baron Cohen is a writer, producer, director, actor. Uh, he, uh, you know, I mean, you know, his work is is all about like finding things, improvising. Same with Jeremy Strong. I mean, he's you know, method actor. Then you got two British trained actors, Eddie Redman and Mark Rylance, and Mark Rylance also a theater director. So very different styles of working, a big ensemble cast, and Aaron, who really only wants to shoot exactly what's on page, um, and him not being so involved in camera setups as I'm used to, you know, where I have uh, James Mangold, who's also a still photographer, uh, involved in, you know, the design, the shots, the movement. I mean, it was all left up to me, and then I'm also pretty much dictating what the coverage should be, and um giving a, a list of all the shots to the script supervisor every morning and really being you know primarily concerned about getting what Aaron really needs but then also giving him options and giving him extra mm-hmm. coverage which he didn't always feel like he needed but when I think you know it was much appreciated in, in the editing in the know. editing and um yeah, with, but ultimately, you know, with, he was very happy with it. With Sorkin, uh, it's all about the language. 
It's uh, all about the rhythm of the language. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And 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 you as a cinematographer, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, you, you you want to make it as cinematic and dynamic as possible. Well, but, of course. But also, but you, uh, also you want you to give. You also don't want to hijack the movie. And, right. And, right. You know, which I think on Molly's game. He didn't fully, I mean, that was his first experience directing, and he didn't fully understand or, you know, what what's involved and, you know, what you need to do when you shoot. And I think, you know, there were some moments where, you know, he was not happy just because, um, you know, things happened that he didn't feel were necessary. And, and so I was very respectful of that because Stuart Besser, the producer who, who I'd done 310 to Yuma with, and identity he did molly's game and he gave me a heads up and he said look he's going to rely very heavily on you but he also knows what he wants and you know so i was very respectful of not you know imposing things on him that right. he wouldn't be comfortable with but you know i mean you have a director that sits at the monitor mostly with his eyes closed because he's really focused in on the rhythm of how the actors read it and if they say it right he goes, great, got it, move on. And, you know, there are other factors, of course, when you're actually filming. I go, well, here the camera, you know, mm. st- stalled or here, you know, a light fell over and hit the actor in the head and his hair <laughs> caught on fire. I mean, just joking, but like, and he would go, so does that mean we have to go again? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know. So you don't have him really scrutinizing the frame and the image per se. So, uh, you know, you have extra responsibility to make sure, you know. Well, this um, you mentioned this earlier, but this is an extraordinary cast. Uh, I mean, I was yeah. watching it, and and seventy five percent into it, Michael Keaton pops up, but I'm like, could this get any better? Uh, I know, right? And he was great. Like he came in for two days. We had him one day in his house, and we only had him for one day in the court, of course. And yeah, it was great. It has to be exhilarating for you to see these performances take shape from a yeah. cast like this. To me, that's always the greatest inspiration is, um, you know, seeing the actual performance in the actual space. I don't like to preconceive too much and decide on coverage and lighting and till I actually have all the elements in front of me and see how somebody's body language is, see how somebody's, you know, his speech and his rhythm and, and that dictates to me also how it should be lit, how it should be composed. I mean, same with Nebraska, you know, and like seeing Booster and how is he moving? Oh, he's playing this and, you know, you, we need a wide shot for this. We really don't need a close-up. We need, you know, so it's, it's nice to draw your inspiration from these uh, great performers. And, I mean, Walker Lyon being probably mm. the most obvious example, I mean, Joaquin Phoenix in general, like you never really know what he's going to do. And it's pointless to sit there and storyboard and shot list something because suddenly he'll get up and he'll rip the sink out of the wall and which was not planned. And it's actually been in that school building since 1950. And, uh, you know, that's a one or <laughs> one take deal. Um, but, you know, you got to I think that's the beauty of. Uh, our job is to capture these little moments, these gems that the performers give you, and you just got to be there with the camera at the right place at the right time and mm. and uh, take advantage of all that. And that's why that's why I admire directors who can do that and uh, prefer working under that system rather than, you know, and I, I'm not putting them down. I mean, I'm the incredible craftsmen and filmmakers, but like Chris Nolan or Fincher, or even Gore Vabinsky, who I did two movies with, they are, you know, it's, I look at the films and I go, that's great craftsmanship. It's yeah. great filmmaking. But sometimes I'm not emotionally involved with the characters as much as I would like to be. Right. At, are, do you find that actors are, in general, invested in, are, all right, how are, you, how are you filming me, the distances, that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, they are. They are. But, you know, in our case here, because of the mixed group, um, less so because some are theater actors. I mean, of course, Mark Rylance has been in, you know, he was in Bridge of Spies and all that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, so it's more about, like, their space, their stage, how they move, not so conscious of the camera. Um, um 
compared to, let's say, somebody like George Clooney, who I worked with as an actor and a director, but you know, he's completely aware of what the camera does when he sees us discussing something. He goes, you want me to do this? I can help like this. And mm. what are you? Are you on a 40 mil? Okay, so so it cuts me off right here, right? And uh, what am I, too tall? I can spread my legs a little bit. And, you know, just that kind of, like, real movie actor professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't really have in this cast because Matt Damon and Christian Bale, I mean, they're real movie actors. I mean, they're movie stars. And and they know all this. And Dustin Hoffman, when I worked with him, he was always like, what millimeter are you on? Mm. So you're here, right? So they adjust their performance to that. And, you know, they know Russell Crowe in 310 to Yuma, when you see that last close-up when he's with Christian Bale in the room before they go out for the train. I mean, it's like so minimal his performance, his gestures, but he knows he's like going to be 70 feet wide on the big screen. And, and then when you see it cut together and on the screen, you go, wow, there it is. It's like so subtle, but it's mm. just the right amount. It's beautiful. I mean, uh, uh, you know, all the, all the art forms in the film, uh, in, in films, the, they're a mixture of the technical and the, and the purely emotional. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like um, without the emotional, you got nothing. I mean, you know, some of the most beautiful movies, I mean, I don't know, like Snow Falling on Cedars is probably one of the most beautifully photographed movies. But, you know, if you're not connecting uh, the same degree to the story and the characters, then it's just pretty to look at and ultimately yeah. boring. I mean, to me, it's always like, I know the movie's not working when after screening somebody comes up to me and goes, that, that just looked beautiful. Your move, your work was stunning. And then I know, shit, the movie didn't work. <laughs> you know, you know it, go and it's go, a oh funny... Oh my God, I mean, you know, Joaquin was incredible or Bruce Dern, it's like, it's such a great movie and I laughed and it reminded me of my uncle back in Nebraska and, you know... It's that's, so that's it's so you know. it's so odd that you mentioned Snow Falling on Cedars because I I asked uh, <laughs> I asked Richardson about that and he said yeah. he attended some screening of it and he just hated it he he hated looking well, at it as beautiful as it was it is so beautiful I mean I remember it was nominated for the AC and then you know I saw it in the opening shot it's a boat out and it's in the fog and I go oh my god this is like but then you know it just doesn't hook you. Right. And, you know, um, <clears throat> Ethan Hawke or whatever it is, you know, whatever element it was, like, if you don't get hooked, then, I mean, you can only look at, you know, a pretty photo book of Maine, you know. It's might, as, might as well be a, fo- you know? uh, a postcard or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're talking about actors. I mean, the w- one director who was so intimately, intensely uh, involved with actors was uh, Cassavetes and your father of course as an art yeah. director he worked quite often with Cassavetes yeah I mean I know John I mean they were cousins that my dad did faces and women and influence me Moscovich love streams and you know that was my you know my first exposure really to when I moved to America in 83 I mean John was very sick with liver cirrhosis but i got to spend a lot of time at the house and we were always talking movies and i had come from europe and i was a fan of antonioni and which is very different you know it's all very visual and and uh you know without a lot of words and john's all about you know the camera is the slave to the performance and you know he would jump on the dolly and start pushing around and nobody knew what he's doing and everyone you know actors could kind of you know be free Mm-hmm. The freedom to be free, as he said. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, that was a, a big inspiration. But on the other hand, like, he didn't understand, like, photography or cinematic language, how he can also augment and contribute to performances. Because he actually, I remember him asking me, and I was like 24, he'd said, So I don't understand, like, beautiful photo- photography. What do you do? Like, I cut to a sunset and then I cut back to my actor? Like, how does that work? <laughs> Wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I know as a as a actually, I want to ask you this too about Cassavetes. Did you did you use a camera that he filmed? Yeah, I faces sure did. Or? I mean, my very first. So I came from Europe. I mean, I grew up in Munich and I studied fine arts, and then uh, I'd seen like 
you know, I got into cinema like 18. Like I noticed, I wrote down Raul Qatar's name. I go, I want to do that. Whatever this is, whatever that position is, like cinematographer, because it's like my still photography, mm -hmm. but also there's movement and there's performances. And there was Brigitte Bardot, and I was really into her, and <laughs> Michelle Piccoli, and Jack Palance, and Fritz Lang, and I'm like, I want to do that. So, uh, and I had sent some stills of mine to John, and he wrote me this letter, which really triggered me to actually move to America. It goes, you know, your your images capture the spirit of a new generation in a classic form. Mm. Mm. <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever. To me, it meant a lot, though. And he's like, can't wait for you to join us. So I came and then, but they were in post on Love Streams and we were in New York and then I met Liz Gazar, Ben Gazar's daughter, and she goes, I want to do this short and you should shoot it. And I'm like, I've never shot anything before. And she's like, oh, you know, whatever. It's the same. It's still, I mean, you got to set the stop and, you know, compose. I'm like, sure. Okay. So, uh, then we found John's camera, the Eclair NPR 16 millimeter that uh, was in the closet uh, back in LA on Woodrow Wilson where his house is. And uh, uh, of course he lent it to us. And um, I looked, you know, there was a two page manual. <laughs> like I'd learned how to thread it and how to load the mags. And then I taught my camera assistant per se, of course, wasn't the camera assistant. Like, I guess this is how you got to adjust focus because in stills, of course, you know, well, there's no moving focus. I'm like, maybe if you mark the ground and then mark the lens and then coordinate. You know? <laughs> I remember coming up with that system on my own. <clears throat> but, yeah, it was John's camera that he had shot faces with. Mm. Yeah. I'm for a movie fan. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a movie fanatic. I mean, that yeah, there's something of kind of romantic <laughs> about that notion of I'm shooting with Cassavetti's camera. I mean, I geek out about that. No, kind of, of stuff. course, of course. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you do not like to storyboard, uh, which, which, well, you know, look, I mean, when we do something like Ford versus Ferrari, we did storyboard, we pre -vis certain sequences. You can't really make a movie like that because you can't even budget it really, mm -hmm. unless you know exactly, you know, how many cars you have to <laughs> flip over. <laughs> um, but for, you know, more uh, traditional dramatic stories like with Alexander, like Sideways and Descendants and Nebraska. And mm -hmm. We we don't. I mean, we watch movies, we watch De Sica, we watch Kurosawa, we watch Ozu. we not always related to what we're doing, uh, just movies we like. I like uh, I showed him Walkabout, I think, for... I don't even know which one, but it's just like, oh, here you see, I like how they did this, and I like how the pacing is here. And so that's really the extent of our prep is like cooking, pasta, I'm watching a movie. He'll show me like half hour of something, or we'll watch your last detail, and then I'll say, let's watch, you know, Walkabout, and and but it's not like specifically about what we want to do. And then, you know, you just get a sense of who that person is, what his aesthetics are, how he likes to, uh, take in stories and how he likes to tell stories. And then, you know, as a cinematographer, your job is to interpret that and get the closest to what the director wants to achieve and then give that to him, you know? Yeah. And that's why I don't like to dominate really with, I don't like people saying, Oh, I saw this movie. It looks like Faden shot it. Like my move, my work. Hopefully, I think really varies. I mean, obviously, Cool Runnings looks very different from Phenomenon, from Patch Adams, from mm -hmm. Nebraska, from Weatherman, from Ford versus Ferrari. I mean, they're all very different. And I do admire cinematographers that are versatile and don't like bully their look onto a movie. And, you know, where it might work with some movies, like Storaro with Bettolucci, of course, did beautiful work, but. You know, sometimes you just go, okay, like on this Woody Allen movie, it's just like he's just overpowering, you know, with his golden beams yeah. and <laughs> rim lights. And, you know, it's just, I, I, you know, that's why I like Chivo's work because 
you know, you can do, uh, 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 you know, gravity, and then you can do Itu Mama Tambien, you know, I mean, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I would think that, I mean, you ha you have worked with Mr. Payne on several occasions, yeah. but I would think that working with a, a wide palette, palette of directors pushes you to, to, to uh, of course, accustom to yourself the, to what they want. The yeah. beauty of it, you know, and I feel kind of bad for my friends, like, I mean, Janusz has to do all, I mean, has, you know, I mean, he's fortunate enough to do all of Steven's movies, but, uh, you know, he always goes, oh, you're so lucky you get to work with all these different directors, and, you know, and he gets some opportunities. I mean, he got to try something completely different, um, Diving Bell and Butterfly, but, but, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's really what refreshes me and keeps me and engaged and my profession is like different in the air and being so different from mm -hmm. anyone else and especially in c contrast to Mangold who is very involved technically and you know is involved in the color correction I mean Aaron didn't sit in on the DI and you know but he likes it like what we do he goes that's great you guys made it like I didn't realize you can make it even so much nicer still and yeah. uh, you know whereas Mango is like, you know, two more <laughs> points of red and <laughs> right. one point of cyan, you know, and uh, saturation up 3% and, you know, and sitting in on the mix and everything, you know. So, but that's the beauty of it, that, you know, we, we get to adjust and, you know, serve these directors, help them try and tell their story, like whether it's a very technical director. I, I mean, as long as the director knows what he wants and has a vision, I mean, our biggest nightmare is just somebody who, just doesn't really know what he wants or even has like a little technical knowledge. That's like the worst. <laughs> and, <laughs> just enough and to do danger you know, with. Walk yeah. around with a finder and look for a shot for like a really long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but doesn't really know where he wants to be. I mean, I prefer somebody like Aaron who knows exactly what he wants, has no idea how to achieve it, but he'll be the first one to say it. He's like, you know, this is, this is, I need this, I need that, the insert of the bottle hitting the ground, you know, but, but, you know, it doesn't. He trusts you uh, to do you your know, job. And, and yeah. yeah. And then he's not like here going a hi hat, you know, to shoot it at 48 frames. He's just like, I really just an important beat, you know, for a story. Like, you know, I need to see a guy getting hit in the head with a baton and blood coming out because there's a line, you know, let the blood flow all across the city. And, you know, so it's all connected to, the writing that you know uh it's it's fun for me to 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 find that and even you know uh like Vin Benders I did million million dollar hotel and mm. you know I grew up watching Robbie Miller and Vin Benders work and and um uh you know we communicated very little actually when we did a million dollar hotel but I knew like it's right exactly where he wants it to be right visually. and it's just you know my aesthetics and his and Robbie's I mean, it was so influential to me that I knew, you know, and it looks like a Vin Menders movie. And when I do a little European movie for some obscure European director, it looks like the other work because that's my main uh, goal is to, uh, you know, tell their story and, and have it be have it be theirs. Yeah, yeah. I know the, the need to uh, to really know what you're going after before you start shooting a film. One of one reason of which is budget, like you said. But mm -hmm. a lot of movies feel like they are preconceived within an inch of their lives. Yeah. And I like watching movies that feel like they're happening in the moment. And I, right. I, I heard one director say, when you make a narrative film, it should it should feel like a documentary of the day you right. were shooting that. Right. I, I love that sentiment. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you watch Sideways, and it's very precisely scripted. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to life, and you've got Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden Church and their chemistry, and the dialogue just seems so not written, but it's very... I mean, Thomas Hayden Church once said during the shoot, you know, what, if I say this instead of that, and Alexander was like... Let me see. And he thought about it for like a minute and a half. He goes, no, let's stick with the screenplay. And, you know, but it's, it's, 
you know, it's just in his head. He thought about that word for a long time. And when he wrote it, and there's a reason he chose that particular word versus this one. And, but, you know, good writing is, it just makes it feel not written. And, right. and then good performances, of course, you know, I mean, a good performance, a great actor. I mean, uh, John Goodman, we were having in Monuments Man, which, but, you know, John could just make or, Bill Murray could just make every line work, you know, yeah. and now I'm working on this thing and it's a thriller and it's a genre movie, but I got great characters and I'm working with one of the greatest actors in Greece, um, Makis Papadimitriou and, uh, uh, and I mean, the way he just makes these scenes work, you go, oh yeah, you know, that's, that's a whole nother level of talent too. Yeah. To, to pull pull these off and then of course you know that then warrants a different shot than what you had planned because it's like okay you're gonna give me that i'm gonna take it i'm gonna you know i'm gonna put my camera here instead of back here where i was planning on putting it so you know that's why i think it's important to you know have an open mind and and, and be astute and aware and and, and always be on the lookout for those things and not miss not miss these little gifts that they give you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Faden, my friend, I uh, I love <laughs> I love the movies you work on, and thank uh, you. Uh, stay safe. Well, hopefully we'll get to do some more, and it's I'm not all gonna. I still want to shoot for the big screen, and I'm you know in this case I think it's probably a good thing that Netflix <laughs> took this over and. I mean, like, as we say, tragically, it couldn't be more timely right now. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I mean, it feels. It but feels... I think because of Netflix and people being more likely to watch at home, I mean, it's probably going to reach more people this way. So I, maybe it's a good thing. But I just hope for our future and for all filmmakers, you know, I, my, my, my desire is still to shoot for the big screen and get people back into the cinemas at some point. Yeah. Are you are you hopeful that 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 day is on the horizon? <laughs> I know I'm not I I can't I mean I had this whole other what's the journalist Joe Joe Morgan from Wall Street um, uh -huh. Morgan Morganstein he did a whole article about that he was interviewing me and it's like is this the end of cinema you know theatrical viewing and because, you know, people upgraded their home systems, they got better TVs, they got better sound systems, and, you know, I think they'll go out for certain spectacle movies. And um, But, you know, will these kind of movies ever successfully return to the big screen? I don't know. Yeah, the mid-range movies. Are, yeah, that mid-range, yeah. which was always my playing field. Sure. You know? These sort of adult dramas and, you know, that used to exist with Fox Searchlight and and uh, Fox 2000, and, you know, that were like 20 to $40 million, like Pursuit of Happiness, those movies. And um, and they've kind of gone away. I mean, they've become smaller and smaller, and they've become Amazon or uh, Netflix or mm. so. I mean, part of me um, is very thankful for Netflix because they – uh, of course, they, they put a lot, of, a lot of eyes on these these kinds of movies that I cherish. Of course, these, this I mean, I remember the Z Channel. I don't know how long oh, you've yeah. been around, but and actually, my cousin John's daughter Zan Cassavetes made a whole uh, documentary of the Z Channel. Yes, uh, it's great. About, uh, what's his name? That programmer, and who really also not only would you know show all these classics, but he also would give movies a chance that had. Uh, uh, you know, couldn't get theatrical distribution and he'd premiere them on the Z channel. And I mean, you know, Netflix is, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of things on Netflix and I'm also subscribed to the Criterion collection. And during mm. this lockout, I mean, I spend a lot of time just revisiting, you know, all these films. And, I mean, yeah. That Criterion collection channel is, uh, I live on that channel. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's beautiful. That's great. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Fade, my friend, you stay safe. Right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You too. Stay safe and sane and fingers <laughs> crossed for our future.